Welcome, everybody. This is Oracle Apex Office Hours, and today is July 11th, 2024. Today, we're going to be talking about what's new in Oracle Apex 24.1, and this is part three of a four-part series. The previous two series recordings have already been posted on Apex at oracle.com slash office hours, should you wish to review them later. So before we get started, just a few announcements and updates, as usual. We have an upcoming in-person conference just around the corner starting this weekend in Nashville, Tennessee. It's the Apex Conference at ODTUG K-Scope 24. Many of our team are going to be there in person. We've got the boot camp going on and a lot of great, exciting Apex content across over 65 sessions in the general sessions, as well as a Symposium Sunday, which starts this Sunday. Very excited about all that. We have other upcoming conferences, including the Latin America Oracle User Community Tour 2024. Uh, there are 10 different uh, countries that are represented, but we're going to be doing at least three of them. We're going to be at Mexico. We're going to be in Chile and Brazil this year. There's also the Oracle Apex Nordic Tour starting in August 26th in Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. And of course, we got Oracle Cloud World also around the corner here in the second week of September back in Las Vegas. That's going to be a really exciting event as well. All these events are super exciting. So you can, as I mentioned earlier, you can replay the previous office hours. The, the part one and part two have already been posted on apex at oracle.com slash office hours. Uh, this actual recording or this actual session right now is being recorded and it should be available in the next week or so. We have several new blogs. Uh, you should go ahead and visit apex.oracle.com slash blog to see them all. Uh, there are a lot of new ones having to do with archiving human uh, tasks and workflows and REST data sources and nested JSON responses, just to name a few. And we also have a new learning path for empowering low-code apps with AI. So you can learn the latest advancements of AI in Oracle Apex with a bunch of hands-on labs. I mean, there's at least, what, three or four Apex and AI hands-on labs that we currently have published. And in addition uh, to all that, we have this great content as a learning path available for free today at Oracle University. So there's some ground rules for today on this session. If you have any questions, please do not use the chat. You can say hello in the chat, but ask your questions in the Q&A section of Zoom. This way, everybody has an opportunity to have their question answered. But having said that, let's try to keep all the questions during this session relevant to the content being presented. No random questions that have nothing to do with the content during this session particularly, so that we can focus on answering the questions that have to do with the content being presented. If you have any other more complicated questions that might take a deeper understanding from the team, please go to apex.oracle.com slash forum and create a new post there on the discussion forum for the community where we can get more eyes on the particular problem and be able to take our time in answering your question. So this four-part series, What's New in Apex 24.1, started on June 20th with a general overview about general uh, Gen AI in Apex. And then on June 27th, we covered vector search in 23AI, the new select one-to-many items, and working copy improvements. And today, we're going to be looking at workflow and approval enhancements component groups, and builder extensions. So you can see we've got a, a, quite a lineup here of great content and great presenters from the Apex development team. Uh, we do have another office hours coming in a couple of weeks here for date picker support, generate PDF documents, and REST source infrastructure. So be sure to join back again to see the next episode. And today's special speakers are going to be Shrihari Rava, Ananya Chatterjee, and Christian Rokita talking about the specific features that they developed into the Apex product. We're going to start it off today talking with Sherhavi uh, Rava about the improved shared component subscriptions and component groups. So having said all that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and let Sherhavi take over. Welcome, Sherhavi. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> today, I wanted to discuss uh, two topics. One is uh, improved shared component subscription in 24.1, and the other one is uh, regarding the new shared component called component groups. So before going that, I just wanted to uh, briefly revisit what we have done in 23.2. So in 23.2, we have uh, extended subscription to several shared components. As part of uh, uh, extending the subscription functionality, we have also added some new features to this uh, functionality. One is uh, once a component is subscribed, now it will become read-only. Uh, we are also adding a new column called subscription status, so you can see whether the component is still up to date with its master or not. And we also have added an option to bulk refresh the uh, subscribed components. And uh, also when we are uh, doing the refresh or copy, we automatically resolve the dependencies of a shared component if it, if it is using build option, for example. Um, but 
these new features which were added in 23.2 they were not available to some of the shared components that already support the subscription functionality so in 24.1 uh, these are the shared components which already support the uh, subscription but they were lacking these features or some or all of these features so now all these shared components also support the same functionality so i will quickly show you that so i will uh, go to an existing application so shared components authorization schemes so if you see in 23.2 uh, if you have uh, an authorization scheme is subscribed if you go and uh, try to modify it you will still be able to do it uh it but now you can see it is uh, displayed as uh, completely read only and uh, you can also see a subscription status whether it is up to date or not and if you have several shared components which are subscribed you can also see uh, all the shared components that needs refresh uh, and uh, if there are you will also have a bulk refresh option here to quickly refresh all the shared components so all these features are now available for all uh, these uh, shared components one thing i would like to highlight uh, for example if this is a shared component which was already subscribed in 23.2 once you upgrade it to 24.1 you will see the subscription status as uh, could not determine needs refresh the reason is that uh, as i said in 23.2 you could uh, go ahead and modify the shared component even though it is subscribed so once we upgrade it we are we are really not sure whether the content of this shared component are in sync with its master or not so that is the reason we will have this temporary status could not determine my needs refresh uh, to get rid of this you just need to refresh the shared component or you can go to the master shared component or you can just publish it so this is a one time task you need to do once you upgrade it to 24.1 with respect to existing shared component that were already subscribed now i will go to the next topic that is uh, component groups so component groups is a new shared component that has been introduced in 24.1 this this is a this component group shared component is basically a collection of other shared components it doesn't have any other functionality except holding a collection of other shared components so what do you do with this collection so you can use these component groups to copy all these components across multiple applications while copying you can also say hey i would like to subscribe to all these components as a group you can also do that and once you subscribe to the component groups which, which automatically subscribes to all the components which are part of it you could uh, do bulk refresh like all the components in one go uh, it could be different components right it is not just single uh, type of components the component group can contain different types of shared components and uh, you can also bulk uh, publish right you can also publish a component group which means that all the components which are part of that uh, component group will be published not just that uh, so once you have a library app and uh, uh, you all your subscribing applications have copied and subscribed to the component group and when you add a new reusable components to your uh, library app and you add them to the component group all the subscribing applications can see that Hey, there is a change in the component group in the library app, so they can refresh it to get the new shared components into the uh, into the uh, into their applications. So previously there was no way; you, you just need to manually communicate that. You need to manually know it. Okay, there is a new component you wanted to bring it. Now, once you add it to the component group, the apps can see it. There is a change. Okay, so let us uh, uh, show me the demo quickly. So I will start with creating a component group. so i will just say um group abc i will just give it a demo comment so once you click on uh, component group you will see additional options where you can assign components to the component group so i will click on assign and here i i can choose what type of components i wanted to assign so all the components that support subscription can be part of the component group so i will choose an application item i uh, let so i would like to assign this and uh, i would like to choose an application process i would like to assign this right like this i can assign and of course you can also just click on this and and assign it so i already have created such a component group which has uh, some decent combination of uh, different types 
uh, I have some rules, I have some application computation, application processes, right? Some settings, build options. So some decent amount. Now let me go into uh, another window where I have uh, opened the, the same workspace in the context of uh, um, subscribing application. So I will just create a new app. So new app two. Let me go into the shared components and component groups. So now I have the library app, which has some essential components to start with for my new application development. So I can copy that easily with few clicks. So I can click on this uh, copy from another app and I can select uh, the essential components one for the new app and I would like to subscribe to it. So it will quickly show me uh, what are all the components it is going to copy into this app and some actions. I will, I will explain the actions a little later. So I click on this uh, component group. Now the component group is copied along with all these uh, components and you can see all the status of these components is also up to date, right? If I can go to, for example, uh, uh, application process, I can see this process is copied and it is subscribed from uh, this library app. So it's good, well and good. I can use it easily in my new applications. But uh, can I use it in my existing applications? Yes, you can still use it. So I have a, an example for that. I have an existing application. So, uh, but now you have the component groups. Maybe you want to create a group, uh, a component group in your library application or master application. But how can you make use of that concept in the existing app? So I will quickly show you. So I have uh, a few items, for example, which are already subscribed. Right, so you, you have an existing app where some of the components are already exist, some are subscribed, some are not subscribed. Right, so now let us go to component groups and I can do the same steps again. I would like to copy the component group from the library application, the same component group. I would like to subscribe as well because uh, uh, that's what I wanted to do. And when I click on next, now I see few more statuses here, right? So here, what we have an algorithm basically which checks for each component in the master uh, component group. It checks whether that component is already subscribed in this particular application. If it is already subscribed, and the subscription status is also up to date, we just reuse it. We don't. We do nothing. We just link it to this component group. We just reuse it. And this could be another case, it is already subscribed, but uh, it was not up to date, right? There was some changes in between. In that cases, we refresh it uh, and reuse it. So that's this is another status. And there is another case where uh, uh, it is not subscribed, but we found this, some components with the same name, right? So uh, I, I, my application already has a list of values with the country's LOV, and now, the component group from the master application also has a list of values. So in this case, it is not subscribed, so we are going to replace it. As you can see, it is in the red color, so which is little uh, uh, danger. You, you need to give attention to this. The reason is we are going to replace this LOV with the LOV from the master application, right? Same with the application process. Because the name is same, we assume it is the same component. So if you if you if you wanted to delink this, if you say no, no, this is a dif different uh, component, but using the same name, you can click on cancel and you can just rename the components in this app so that it won't detect it. If you're fine with it, then uh, I'm fine. So these are all the I'm using the same name because it's the same component. Then I'm fine with this replace and uh, all these actions. So I can just click on copy. Now my existing application is also using the concept of component groups. Now I can quickly show you how uh, modifying the component group in the master application and what happens in the subscribing app. So this is the master application. So what I will do, I will, uh, uh, in the component group, let me delete, uh, for example, uh, uh, this country's LOV, right? So this LOV is deleted. And I will assign 
maybe if there is, yeah. So I will assign this colors LOV instead to this component group. So I have added one, I have assigned one and unassigned one. And I will also update some of the code. Maybe I will take the application process, what we have. Right, so I will just update some code. So I will click on apply changes. And uh, I also wanted to update the component settings. So for example, for uh, date picker, I would like to show the week as well as uh, I would like to paginate by multiple months. So all the options I would like to use by default in all my apps. So these settings now are subscribed or pushed to all the apps. So this way you can also you know use similar settings for all these items in all applications. Okay, so I have done some changes. Um, I can also just for here I can also say version one dot one just for some reference. Good. So I have done some changes. Now I will go to my subscribing application. If I go to component groups, I can see here the status is saying now it needs refresh. So if I go inside, uh, I can see some of the components. Uh, it needs refresh because these are updated. The date picker settings are updated. The uh, this code is updated, right? But there is more to the story, right? There are some components that are unassigned. Some components are assigned. So that you can only see when you click on the refresh. So when you click on refresh, we don't directly do the refresh. Instead, we do the preview. So in the preview, you can see what are the changes that are that will happen during this refresh. So we are saying so there is there are some changes to these components which are already part of the component group. So we are just going to refresh them. And this LOV was unassigned, so we are going to unassign it. This LOV is being newly assigned, so we are going to add it. And please note that when we unassign it, it is just unassigned from the component group. We don't automatically delete any components when we unassign it. I'm good with this. I click on refresh. Now we can see the component subscription status is up to date for all the components and the colors LOV is now added and the country's LOV is gone. And we can also see the some of the changes. For example, I have changed uh, uh, component settings for date picker. I have selected uh, all the options. Now we can see all these uh, settings are here. So this way we can uh, easily uh, uh, maintain the subscription from one app to another using component groups. Now, I would like to touch on a few uh, points. So one is uh, deleting. So what happens if you delete a component group? So let us see that. So once you delete a component group, we just delete the component group and the, these assignments. All these shared components and the subscriptions will still be there as it is. So there is no change there. So I can quickly show that. I just delete it. Yes, I would like to delete it. And if I go to any of the subscribed shared components, we can still see, see it, right? There is, there is no change. And now I would like to uh, go back to the component group. Uh, I, I would like to copy the same component group again. Now, ideally, it should, it should show everything will be reused, right? Because all the components are there, all are up to date. Uh, so it will just reuse it. It's very uh, uh, quick and fast and lightweight. Right. And what happens if I click on unsubscribe it, right? So this is the action which uh, uh, you wanted to do uh, when you're very sure. Because when you click on unsubscribe, we just unsubscribe not just this component group, but even though all these uh, uh, components as well, right? So you should be uh, really sure when you want to unsubscribe, it will also unsubscribe all the components. And finally, I, I want to quickly show uh, one thing. Uh, let us go to 
this application. So when there is a shared component, which is uh, subscribed by the component groups, then you will have very uh, less options. So let me initial components. So I will uh, go to this application computation, for example. Right, so this component, it is subscribed and it's also part of a component group. In this case, you cannot do anything. It's read-only, you cannot delete it, you cannot unsubscribe it. The only action you can do is cancel. And if it is a, a status is needs refresh, you can click on the refresh to refresh it. That is the only action you can do. But if the component is subscribed directly, you can actually unsubscribe it and you can also delete it. So there is a minor difference between uh, direct subscription and uh, subscription via the component group. So that's it, all I had for the demo. Thank you. Srihari, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time and walking us through that feature. We have at least one question that we'd like to ask an answer live. Um, the question was, can you have a component group consisting of component groups? Yeah, that's a great question. So for phase one, we have not planned it. So uh, it, is, it, it is in the pipeline. So it is, uh, yeah. Okay. And another question from Travis is, uh, if my application needs the published version of a bunch of shared components, but needs to customize just one particular LOV, do I have the option to unsubscribe just that LOV or will it overwrite when refreshing the component group? The question's right. in the Q&A. Yeah. So in, in such cases, what I would do, uh, I will create uh, uh, two component groups, right? So if I can uh, quickly share. So in the master application, um, so in the master application, I can create any number of uh, uh, component groups, right? One component can be part of multiple component groups, right? So what I would do, I have essential components. I will just copy this quickly. I will say essential component, uh, essential components too. So this will not have the LOV, right? I will just delete the LOV from here and then I'm good to go. So. This is very flexible. You can have uh, uh, one component group, of course, multiple components, and one component can be also part of multiple component groups. Very cool. All right, so let me just segue into the next content area. So that we're talking about improved shared component subscriptions and component groups. Up next, we have Ananya Chatterjee talking about workflow and approval enhancements. Ananya, you ready? Yes. Hi, everybody. As you all know, Workflow was a new feature introduced in 23.2 release of Apex. And with uh, the 24.1, we brought some enhancements and improvements to the existing feature, which I will walk you through. Along with that, we have certain changes that we have done in the human tasks area also, which I will briefly walk you through. So the first change that I want to talk about is in the workflow console area. So let's just start by creating a new workflow console, which uh, uh, the, which we had introduced in 24.1. And let's choose the report context as initiated by me. Uh, just to give a brief re recap, this is the console area where you see all your existing running completed or terminated workflow instances. What uh, you see here is newly added is the include dashboard page that you see here. You see that? And this dashboard page is basically uh, an out of the box generated page that allows you to monitor the status of your workflow instances, how many of them have faulted or how many of them have completed or how many of them are active and at which activity are they waiting on? And also an average uh, completion time. So it's out of the box and uh, definitely customizable like all the other generated pages. So let's quickly do that. So that's that. Once we've created this, uh, let's go to the running application and just refresh it. So where do we have, this is our new console, right? Before, before we go to the console, even let's go to the dashboard that got generated by default. So this is how your out of the box dashboard looks. Uh, so if you see here, uh, you have the workflow state that is showing up. You see, you get an indication of how many are active, how many are suspended or terminated. So you see that there's one active instance of the laptop request workflow. You can see that there is, uh, there are like, three instances of terminated uh, workflow 
the laptop request. And you can see that there's one suspended for a laptop request and one for expense reimbursement workflow. So you can see basically uh, since the context was initiated by me. So when I'm logging in as Steve, whichever workflows I have initiated uh, for those, I will get the metrics here. So you can see the active workflow area also. You can see uh, once you click on them, they drill down and show you the uh, particular activity where uh, the workflow is waiting on. Similarly here, for example, the laptop request is waiting on confirmed delivery. You, If, if you happen to have faulted workflow, so you don't have anything, uh, any faulted workflow that was initiated by Steve, so you don't see anything here. And here is uh, the completion, uh, average completion time. If you have multiple workflows, then you get, and get, get a sense of you know, how long it takes to complete workflows on an average. So this gives you that view. And of course, this is customizable depending on your use case. You can restrict it to just this application or all applications in your workspace for which you are an initiator depend totally on your use case. So I will show you another generated dashboard that had uh, owner um, my workflows context, which means for which you are the workflow owner defined as a participant. So this is such another another dashboard like that. So here, if you see, there is a faulted. So there is indeed a faulted workflow for which Steve was not the initiator, but Steve is the owner. So Steve gets to see that, that there is a faulted workflow over there. And you go to faulted workflows and you see that, okay, employee appraisal workflow had faulted at determined uh, VP activity. So this gives you a brief glimpse on uh, uh, on the how your workflows are performing in general. Would be quite useful. Next, let's go to the workflow, uh, the new console. The console uh, is not uh, too different from what you saw in 23.2. However, we made some changes to the details page. This was also a frequent ask by our users and it makes total sense that instead of seeing the activities, how they have progressed just through this section here, if it would be really nice to see a diagram and now you do have it. So you have a workflow diagram area that shows you the uh, diagrammatic representation of where your workflow is. This. There are zoom controls here and you can really uh, configure the zoom as per your need. So as you see here, this particular workflow was terminated over here. And uh, you also have a navigator, a tiny one, so to, to just get a glimpse of the whole thing. So uh, that the workflow diagram is generated out of the box, that's great. But you might want to know whether you can use it somewhere else also in your own page and not just a workflow you know, uh, details page. Yes, you can do that. And let me quickly show you another page we have that was customized a little bit by us, where you can see that with the with each workflow instance in this console, let me show an active one for a change. So here you see this one, you see this tiny diagram uh, over here, right? The tiny icon, this actually links you to a new page where you can open the workflow diagram. And what did it take me? And if you see here, it's all in green and it's waiting here, it's here and here in blue is this confirmed delivery is where it's waiting. So you get a very nice glimpse. So let's quickly look at the page, which is uh, behind this uh, thing that you're seeing. So it's page 31, right? So you see here, it's very simple. It's just one region, a new region of type workflow diagram that you can just take in and put in any of your existing pages. All you need is to configure the attributes. You must have the correct workflow instance ID in order to see this. You can set an initial zoom also. You can do zoom to fit. You can disable the navigator, save it. And let's see if that makes a difference for us. Let's see that. Yeah, so the navigator is now gone. The zoom level is also incremented. So. Yeah, this is also a very convenient feature for especially for end users and users who want to see not only how far their workflow has progressed, but also what is coming. That That is where the benefit of this lies, in my opinion. So moving on, let me quickly show you another interesting thing that we added uh, on the runtime side. That is when you are supposedly wanting to terminate a workflow. So this workflow, as an initiator, I can terminate. Um, not this one, because this is waiting on something else. I would like to actually show you a workflow that got created and resulted in a human task getting created. Let, let's choose this, uh, yeah, for James. Let me raise a request, a laptop request for James, right? And do a submit here. So now if I look at workflow status, this should be at the top. And this is, um, no, let me do create it. 
Yep. So this one. So if you see here, this is waiting at an approval task, a human task. And at this point, uh, if I go to my request, I can quickly see who it is waiting on. So it looks like it's assigned to Jane and it's due. But, you know, I changed my mind and I really want to terminate it. So what was happening in 23.2? Yes, you could terminate it, but, you know, the task was still hanging in somewhere. And uh, as an initiator, you would have to go and cancel and do your, you know, housekeeping business separately. So we made that a little bit easier this time in 24.1. So when you terminate this uh, workflow, what you will notice, not only is, is this workflow terminated, you will also notice in my requests uh, that the task got cancelled. Oh, so this is another uh, improvement uh, of usability. And you would, in the history section, you'd be able to see that the task was cancelled as the corresponding workflow instance was terminated. So it makes things crystal clear and nobody will be in for any kind of surprises that why is the task still showing while the workflow is terminated? So that kind of, you know, tying loose ends, you can say. A corollary of this feature is that, uh, as you know, we support custom process type plugins in work as workflow activities that was there in 23.2. So now uh, what you can additionally do is, let me show you a plugin that uh, I will create of process type. I won't create the entire plugin, but I will just show what, what change we have done. And its type is a process. And you see that it's supported for workflow activities. And you can see that as any other process type plugin, you have an execution function name that you need to provide, which will execute when the activity executes. But if you put this wait for completion, if you select this wait for completion, what you will additionally see is uh, the termination function name. You already had the completion function, of course, uh, so that uh, work, the workflow engine of Apex will, will run this completion function when that process type plugin was completed. Similarly, we have another uh, new function called termination function, which you could implement and provide the name of, and the help text will tell you exactly what kind of signature it expects. So once you have that, it essentially means that just like you saw for the human task right now, when the workflow is terminated, this termination function will run for your process plugin and will make sure here, this is where you can put stuff like deleting of records or updating a status when the workflow is terminated to take care of those kind of house housekeeping functionalities for your system of records. You can use the termination function name. So that's that. Uh, one other interesting feature, very minor feature, but very useful uh, is in the debug area. So uh, as you know that uh, we have something called workflow instances, right, in the in the debug area. So this is the uh, area of the debug area. So here in the action section, you have something called a workflow instance that is available now. And you can choose that and put that in. If you know that your application is dealing with workflows, you put that in. And now you have a workflow instance here. And you can filter by workflow instance. Makes your life easier to see exactly what kind of uh, debug messages are appearing pertaining to a work particular workflow instance. So with that, I think I have more or less completed the uh, workflow specific enhancements. Let me quickly move on to the human task specific enhancements that also came in through our ideas app. And thank you so much, everybody, for posting such great ideas. Uh, genuinely heartfelt thank you to everybody. So uh, one of the asks was the vacation rules, which is so popular when it comes to human tasks. You actually, when you're on vacation or you're out of office, you do not want to miss out on tasks that are actioned, uh, supposed to be actioned by you. So how do you deal with them? So with, with 24.1, we uh, you know, introduce this concept of vacation rules. And this sample app that I'm showing, by the way, is available for download from the gallery. So all of you, as we speak, can play with it. Um, I'm not showing anything that's uh, only uh, pertaining to my instance. So here uh, you can see in the manage vacation rules, uh, this is something that you can build for your use case um, where you can add your own vacation rules. Uh, here you can see that for a vacationing user like Bo, the covering user is James. And here is the task definition that's specified over here. So you can see that the task definition can be something else depending on what all task definitions you have. So this is something that is customizable by you. What is happening behind the scene is something I will show you very shortly. But uh, the meaning of this is that 
when some when bo is on vacation and a task gets uh, assigned to bo you the our um, apex will automatically add james as an additional participant which means that bo is not being replaced by james rather james is an additional participant for bo similarly scott is an additional participant for jane so what happens is let's let's just quickly create a a, a salary change so that you know uh, okay let me try and change it to 3250 i hope bo is the salary change uh, let's see who is the pending approval for this one so you can see here right now that i changed it to 3250 you see here that James, who was not the original participant of this, uh, has now been added. And now if I look at the details of this task, you will automatically see in the history area, if you expand the history area, uh, this history does not have it, but you can change it very easily. I will show you another history over here where Scott was added for Jane. Uh, the history section shows an alternate participant and the participant change reason. So this is something that is not there in the task history, in the task details page out of the box, but it's super simple to add it and I'll show you how I added it. So what I did here was, and you can do the same for your own task details page, if, you're, if you know that you have vacation rules to deal with. So in the page, uh, just navigate to the history section in the history area, open this and I just added these two columns, alternate participants and the participant change reason. And that's how you can have a archive or you know store the participant change reason in your system of records through the task history. So how did I build this vacation rule? Let's go to that interesting part. So vacation rules can be specified at two places. One is in the application definition under workflow settings, a new section that we have introduced. For example, here you see this is a procedure that we are calling. You can have your own procedure. You can follow the help text here, which has examples, runnable examples of how you can define vacation rules, what kind of parameters it expects as input, and what is the argument result like. And you need to just copy that, copy that example, and start going on from there. And uh, this, when you specify here, applies to all the task definitions under your application. However, if you want your vacation rule to be specific to a particular task definition and not apply to other task definitions, you can certainly override it. For example, if you want it to be different for salary change and do not want that application level vacation rule procedure, you need to go to the participant section. Here it's empty, but you can add yours here. So that's about uh, how vacation rules work. One other uh, change, uh, another uh, request that we had received was, you know, approval tasks typically we did not allow. Uh, ever since uh, the approvals component or human tasks were introduced, we did not allow initiators of tasks to approve their own tasks. But now, uh, because of multiple requests we received and we saw sense in this ask, we have now introduced in task definitions let's look at this bank account change as a, as a you know as a user of the bank account change you are initiating that request and you should be able to approve that request which makes total sense so in that case in the task definition you can have an initiator can complete switch that we introduced and you can set it here there are two places where you can set this actually even if you don't set it here you can override it in the page process that is using it so let me just show you one of the page processes that we have uh, in one of our pages. Um, we don't even need to go to the bank one. We can check uh, check out uh, any of the request pages actually. So let's look at the request job change page, which uses a page process. Uh, so here in this process section, in the human task create, you can have this initiator can complete, you can override it. So there are two places essentially. So when you override it here, it's only when this task definition is uh, started or created through this page, only then that initiator can complete uh, will, uh, uh, you know, come into action. So this gives you greater control over which kind of tasks uh, you want and which kind of processes you want initiators to be able to complete. So. With that, I come to the end, but that is mm. not really the end. Uh, I know we are running a little short. I'll just take two more mm. minutes uh, <clears throat> to talk about uh, a very another very important ask that was about our 
purging and archival, what kind of improvements we could bring in there. Because you know that we do have these are runtime instances and they do need to get purged out of the system. And we wanted to provide our users with a useful way so that they can seamlessly archive those tasks. So let me quickly show you this workflow archiver um, application that I have. And uh, we have introduced two new views, um, uh, two new uh, flavors of views. Let me say it like that. And I will shortly show you. What you can do is that the views are called uh, Apex Purgeable Workflows, uh, Apex Purgeable Tasks. And I'll show you here for the workflow archiver, where you can see that I have set up an automation here, which will read uh, all the purgeable uh, workflows and which will the automation will come into effect only when there are purgeable workflows. So what do you mean by purgeable workflows? It means that all your workflows that are completed or terminated and the retention period is crossed and the next purge window by the next purge schedule, they will be gone. So only those workflows will come in this area. And uh, you can build uh, actions to archive your uh, workflows depending on what you want to archive. For example, here I have created a package workflow archiver and I'm archiving all the activities, variables, participants and audit information. So let me quickly and very briefly show you how that looks like. Uh, by the way, I do have a blog on this for greater details, people who are interested in archival. This is exactly what I have in the blog and you can actually look at it. So in the workflows archiver, you see here, it's a simple merge that I'm doing. Uh, this is a table that I created out of this, uh, just selecting from this particular view. Uh, and then when not matched, you just insert or you update. So that way, all your purgeable workflows get archived through the automation that is running based on whether there is some stuff to purge or not. And similarly for the tasks archiver, where you can archive the task history, the task comments, the task parameters, et cetera. So I believe with that, I come to the end. This is blogs.oracle.com where you have uh, the very things that I have shown and you can play with the sample approvals, which, which is already available in the gallery. And uh, I hope this was useful. Thank you all. Thank you, Ananya. That was great. A lot of great questions in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for using the Q&A. We have one outstanding question from Michael. Um, he's talking about, they're, they're pretty much talking about the use of the, the phrase vacation rules when it could be proxy rules or a more generic naming. I just saw Ralph had answered that question and someone else is just agreeing with it. I mean, vacation rules, they could be used for any particular purpose you wish. And again, it's just a different way of explaining it that it's very common in work flow land, as Ralph had mentioned in the answer. So again, thank you, Nanya, so much. Let me just share my screen really quick. And this is just to conclude on the fact that we just talked about workflow and approval enhancements from Ananya Chatterjee. And up next, we have Christian Rokita talking about builder extension enhancements. Uh, I mean, all these are really great features. I'm really excited about them myself. I hope everyone that you're enjoying all this content as well. And with that, over to you, Christian. Builder extensions um, is a new feature. Um, we previously had uh, the extension menu, but that was just the start of uh, what we were planning on offering to you. So the feature is intended for developers uh, that want to provide additional tools, of course, built with Apex, uh, to other developers. And these tools should be uh, available and accessible within the builder context uh, without having to install those Apex applications in each and every workspace. Uh, and we call those tools extension applications. Let me walk you through the process on how to build and to publish an extension application. So I've got a workspace here called Tools. Okay. And I've got a small demo application here um, nothing fancy. I'm just going to start this. Um, in order to be able to publish an application as a builder uh, extension, builder extension, um, I need to do two things. Uh, let me sign out here and go <clears throat> to the instance administration. So. In order to publish 
um, build, uh, builder extension applications. A workspace needs an additional um, right to do so. Uh, let me have a look at the existing workspaces. I've got a couple of workspaces here. Um, and you see this new column here, extension. So if I go to this particular workspace and I say, <clears throat> allow hosting extensions and set this to yes. So let me apply this. And now I mark this workspace as being able to publish Builder extension applications. Uh, let's sign out again and go back to this workspace. Tools. Tools. Let's sign in. So I have this application. And in order to, to be able to publish it, uh, I need to uh, provide a uh, dedicated authentication scheme. And this is uh, the Oracle Apex accounts is uh, the default when you create an application. But I want to use the new builder extension sign-in. What this does is um, authenticate, uh, sort of single sign-on. If you're in the builder uh, Apex builder session, it will soon sign on you into this application. Um, create this and provide this application. I'll make it current, of course. Make it the current scheme. Yes. It's okay. Let me see if it runs now. Yes, it does. So nothing special uh, about it yet. Um, the application is just uh, running on the workspace tools. And uh, I'm looking at, um, yeah, what I do in these applications is I have some simple checks on uh, form items, uh, whether they have a, la uh, um, a label, um, check if the if they're uh, if these items are required, if they have the uh, corresponding template, well, whether they uh, need to have a format match, yes or no. And I conf can configure those checks here. Um, can switch uh, certain things on. For example, uh, I want every text field to have a help text. Um, save this. Um, the same for report columns, just checking if the header alignment uh, and the data alignment are correctly. And I might want uh, to enforce that they have a format mask whenever it's a date on the number field. So very simple checks. Um, I store these in local tables in the associate schema, which is called tools as well. Um, and then I I can perform these checks running a report based on the Apex uh, repository views, combining this with the data I have stored in my local tables. Um, so I've got my form checks here. Um, and for convenience, uh, for some checks I perform, I want to uh, define exceptions. In this case, uh, if it's on the login page and it's a password and username, I don't want to check for the required template because it's quite obvious that in the login form, you need to provide a username and a password. So no, so an exception for this one. Uh, the exceptions are stored in a local table as well. So these are the checks. And you see um, all this is running on that one application that I have installed in my workspace. So if I want to publish this, to other workspaces. What we needed to do previously was to export this application and the supporting objects and install it in a different workspace. But because this workspace is marked as an extension workspace or allowed to host extension applications, I can use the extension menu to publish this application for other workspaces to use. So as a workspace administrator, I can manage extension links and 
what I can do here is I can add for this extension. Uh, I can add a, new, a URL and I can publish that. Um, the URL would be the URL to this application. Let me do this with the home screen. So I'm only copying the relative path here because it's always on the same instance. Um, what I do have to provide is the session parameter. And it's not the session um, parameter that you see here uh, for this particular bill of session, but it is um, the session parameter that will be from the invoking builder session, no matter which workspace uh, is invoking. We have a couple of parameters that we support in this URL syntax. And so I'll just add, you need to provide this session parameter in order to uh, invoke this as a uh, builder extension. And I'm gonna publish it. Say publish is yes. So save this, and then I'm going back to my extension demo. I already have this in my own workspace. And just let me close this here. Uh, if I click on it, this should open a new window and then go to the homepage. Okay, but this is within the tools workspace. Let me go to a different browser, in this case, uh, from Canary. And I have a different workspace here. It's called Zero uh, Kita. And let me log in here. I'm a workspace administrator too. Um, let's go to you. You see, I've got two of the sample applications uh, installed in here. I already have an extension menu here, but these are all um, entries I defined myself in this workspace. So let me go to manage service and manage the extension links. So these are my local links. But what I can do now is because there is an extension workspace on this instance, I can subscribe to it. So I can add a subscription here and I see the tools workspace um, is an extension workspace. Um, and I, what I'm doing here is I grant read access to this extension workspace. Um, which means that this workspace will be able to access the Apex repository views of my workspace. We'll see in a moment. So I'll add this as subscribe, going back to Builder. And what you see now is an additional entry called Tools, which is by default the workspace name uh, that I added, and extension as a link. And that's the one I defined in tools. And now I can open this application without having to install it into my own workspace. And it's working on the applications that I installed in my workspace. For all the checks that I defined here, and remember those definitions uh, are placed in tables in the tools workspace. So my extension is running in the tools workspace, but is it has access to the Apex repository views of my C Rokita workspace. You see, and of course I've got a lot of more um, checks here in total, like uh, 69 um, that, are that have failed. Uh, can I look at the primary report? Uh, let's have a look, for example, at anything. Ah, that's anything that is a logging page. And again, you see those checks on passwords and usernames, uh, they failed. Remember, I had this in this application as well. Um, the checks on 
and I um, mark them as exceptions. Those exceptions are kept in a table. Um, if I mark those as exceptions here as well, I will do that. Yeah. So these are all safe. And let me have a look. And now I see a number of additional entries here. So I do see the tools entries and I do see my own entries. And in the original app, because that is a custom table, it's not an Apex repository table, it's a custom table. And if I want to prevent from, uh, if I want to prevent um, this user uh, or this workspace to see uh, other entries here from other workspaces, I might need to um, tune my report here. And we have a couple of APIs um, that are available. So let me go to this exception. Hey, I'm in my tool workspace here. I go to, uh, oh, go to, the, Exceptions, here's my exceptions. So this re this report I have is just a simple report on that uh, table, AC uh, ex exceptions. So if I want to filter it and only make those entries visible to the user that actually belong to the workspace, I can call this API, um, which is, um, returning the workspace that has invoked the extension application because it's still working in the tools workspace uh, with the objects and the database, any associated uh, database schema. Um, but when I'm looking at um, data um, of the Apex repository views, it will return the data from that other workspace. So adding this will restrict um, the entries to the ones belonging to this workspace. So this is how you can um, define reports and, and make data available uh, to different workspace users without having uh, interference with other workspaces. Um, you see, so, what I showed you was um, an API to actually, um, yeah, to actually get um, the workspace uh, that you are currently working in. Um, what I we've got a couple of APIs uh, that we provide, so it's not all just um, configuring in the builder. Uh, if you want to create an uh, extension application and you want to install it in different environments, you might want to script uh, a couple of things like um, um, making the workspace an extension workspace and then granting uh, or subscribing, in this case, granting um, the tools workspace that extension right to that zero kita workspace uh, and of course we have an api to revoke this uh, grant as well so remember you need to have the apex administrator role which is uh, typically when you're installing stuff on on, on your instance you're uh, logged in as sys for example um Another API uh, is to create and uh, remove entries from the extension menu. And that's not only for the um, extension workspace, but for any uh, workspace. Uh, in this case, um, I wanted to create a couple of uh, uh, links to or deep links to, to pages, not just the home page, uh, for example, to the report column check and you see that relative URL here with the session ID again, but uh, I have uh, parameters or uh, 
page zero items um, uh, in my application to actually specify the uh, application and the page I'm currently in. So these additional parameters that you can provide in the URL are within the context of uh, the Apex Builder. So if you're working in the page designer, um, these two variables will have values and they will be passed through the URL. And I have provided my application to um, set those parameters and have, um, let me see, basically have those parameters uh, set those items here. Um, yes. So this, if I run this as a sys user, um, and remember, we only had that one entry uh, in here yet. Let me go to, so I've got, I'm logged in as sys here. Um, Again, I'm granting this uh, uh, or subscribing Serial Kita to, to the extension workspace tools. In this case, already is subscribed, but I'm just going to uh, provide a different label here and uh, the read access. I'm going to remove the one entry that I already uh, created and create a couple of more specific entries here. So let me run this as a script. Ouch. Page is public. Ooh. Probably forgot a comma somewhere. Looks like there's yeah. an extra underscore. Yeah. Come on. Oh, never mind. Mm. Let me roll this back. Uh, and let me run this again. Yeah, it is again. Okay, now it's completed successfully. Let's have a look. By the way, just let's close this one. Sorry, it's under my webcam. Um, go to the builder, and we should have some additional links here. And as I said, when I'm within. So this is a report. That's my form checks. Is there a report in there? Is it? No, it's not. Uh, that's an. That's a, so if I go to the extension menu, report column checks, this should pass the page. So that's application 100, 11. No checks performed. Okay, let's go back to, and then close this one. Go back to the workspace Civil Kita. Do the same here. You see, I've got, I changed the menu entries and the subscribing workspace automatically got the update from, uh, uh, from the extension workspace. So if I go into, oh, let's see, this is an interactive report. The report column check in here. So I see there's a couple of fails here, uh, but it's automatically going to application 103, page two. Um, so that's possible um, um, as an um, build extension application. Uh, remember, you have a couple of uh, uh, views, not all the Apex uh, repository views that you can access. So I've got a list here. Um, so allowed for extensions are basically all the Apex application uh, or Apex app views um, that we provide. Anything that has to do with runtime data, user uh, data uh, will not be uh, accessible for the extension application. <clears throat> 
This means that if you build an extension application, you have, as a developer, you have to take care that you're not using these views to build components in your application because once you started from different uh, um, workspace, those might behave differently. Reports, um, yes, perfect. Um, one other thing, of course, you can use this mechanism uh, to um, uh, on the database, uh, wherever you have uh, an Apex uh, session context. For example, in automations, you don't have to define a session context in automations, but um, you can use um, this mechanism within the context of your extension workspace. So let me see, let's go to that um, tools database schema. Uh, if I select uh, from Apex applications here, uh, that basically should show me the applications that is that I installed in my workspace, which is currently tools, the demo application that I showed you. If I create a session context uh, within my database session and switch the extension context to that schema, uh, to the workspace zero Kita, um, let's execute this. So with this API, um, and when I execute this statement now, it shows me the data from the workspace zero Kita. Uh, and I can, of course, use this um, API, Apex extension, get granted workspace to see which context, in which workspace context uh, I'm currently uh, in. Um, and of course, whenever I leave the session context again, I will see just my own applications installed here. Uh, last thing I wanted to show you is, because um, apart from the APIs that we provide, um, we have a number of, um, uh, well, we have got two views. Um, for example, if you're in um, an extension workspace and you have an automation um, and every night you want to run some checks uh, on those applications subscribed to your extension application um, and you want to identify which ones these are, you can uh, look this up in the Apex Workspace extension grounds. So here's the grant of workspace, here's the extension workspace and you can check if you have read access. Um, and basically this is um, concluding my demo and seeing the time that we already spend it, uh, I'm far, far overdoing it. <laughs> Perfectly fine, Christian. It appears we have one outstanding question. Yes. So having to do with the, 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 the security around the builder extension as a link, is it secure? I mean, I guess the way the demo is done, it appears it's just a link, right? With a session ID, but is there not yeah. more to it? What the what the session ID does, and, and particularly what the um, builder extension uh, sign-in uh, does is, uh, it's validating uh, that you are actually coming from a valid builder session. So if you have a look here, this is the builder session currently, um, and the, um, so that's session uh, 553, and the, um, the, the extension application has its own session, but it, the, the authentication scheme is checking whether there is an active builder session uh, that is trying to log into this extension application. All right. Cool. Using that session ID. Very cool. And of course, because I pass these parameters, these P0 app ID and P0 page ID, um, I had to disable uh, the checksum for those, uh, obviously. All right, that makes sense. All right. So thank you so much on that. Let's go ahead and conclude with saying that this was 
Kira presenting the Builder Extensions Enhancements in Apex 24.1. Thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Uh, if you missed anything in this particular session, don't worry. At apexoracle.com slash office hours, the replay of this session will be available uh, within a week or so, maybe a little bit less. Uh, but just trust that it has been recorded and will be made available like all the other sessions. So just a quick recap. This is session number three, and we have one more session coming to you on July 25th, where we're going to talk about the date picker support, generating PDF documents, and the REST source infrastructure being new features or enhancements in Apex 24. 4.1. So thank you everyone for attending. Please visit for, you know, apexoracle.com slash office hours for these most recent uh, session recordings, as well as all the other ones we've had over the years. I mean, I don't know if we're in triple digits yet, but it feels like it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you learned something today. And I hope you have, hope you have an opportunity to start exercising Apex 24.1 today and start playing with all the Gen AI enhancements, as well as all these great new features. So thank you to our panelists for helping to answer, answer the questions. And thank you to you, the Apex community for being here to participate in these live sessions. So we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. <laughs>